we've started a, a series last week. I know there were a good number of us like, man, it's just been cold. Like, I don't, I don't know why. Like, why does it have to be negative temperatures? Like, someday when we're in heaven, like, we can bring our complaints, right? Like, why? Why is there negative? I like the snow. I love the snow, watching it snow. Some of us need to learn how to drive better in the snow. Um, I, you know, conviction lands wherever it needs to. Like, just let it land. Uh, but, like, I like the snow, but the temperature, why? Like, what benefit is it to go outside and not have skin when you come back inside? Like, what's, I feel like there's no point to that. But, so last week we started a series called Travel Light. And um, most of us at the beginning of each year, like, we begin to look ahead and, and plan and hope and make goals uh, for what the year could look like, what we could accomplish, what we feel like God wants to do in us, where we want to go, like all of those things. But in order for us to do that, we need to figure out if what we are carrying with us is actually going to help us to do that or if it's going to hinder us from doing that. Are we carrying too many things that God would ask us to let go of as we're trying to do and become who he said that we actually are? So last week we started with a, a simple question. Where are we going? And we, we talked about how we needed God to help us to look forward, not so much behind us, but to anticipate and expect him to do something ahead of us and in our now. And, and then we asked him to help us to let go of some things that that were keeping us bound and and, and allowing us to move a lot slower than what we were supposed to be moving. And we talked about locking in, focusing in on him more this year than maybe we ever have, to not be passive in our pursuit of him, to actually get aggressive and go after him with some intention and purpose. And, And today... This week, as we talk about how we can travel light, things that we can let go so that we can move quicker and and be who God has asked us to be, today we are going to talk about something that I believe the enemy uses to destroy relationships and poison hearts. I'm not super excited, but today we will be talking about bitterness. And as you hear that word, like some of us already have a person in mind. Because here's the thing, like we, we probably, all of us, know someone that's bitter. Like you, you get, like as soon as you get around them, man, oh, we try to avoid being around them because of that, right? Because here's the thing, we don't want their bitterness on us. We, we don't want to catch it. And some of us are like, mm, so-and-so needs to hear this message today. Here's the thing about bitterness, it is easy to spot on other people, but it's less easy to spot when it's staring at us in the mirror. I don't know why y'all clapping for that one. <laughs> Ooh, it is true, but it's one of those things, man, like, ah, uh, it's tough. Because bitterness doesn't just show up like you don't wake up one morning and you're like, ah. Like you don't wake up like that. It happens slowly. There's, there's these small seeds that, that show up in our hearts, and it's called an offense. And it's real easy for those to sink in. And, and some of you are like, no, nah, not me. I'm, I'm unoffendable. I pride myself. Watch how quickly and easy this is to get offended. Th- this can happen. Th- this could happen in a conversation that you're having with people this morning. Let someone talk about something they did yesterday, your friend group, and you didn't get an invitation. Oh, we was having game night. Where? I've been to all of them. You didn't get, and then, like, take it up a notch. Let somebody post a picture on social media that you saw. I know 97% of the people in that picture. Why didn't I get an invitation? And then people were like, well, we were going to invite you, but we just knew. And then they gave an excuse why they didn't invite you. Huh. Or... You're on social media, you're scrolling, you're liking things, you're commenting on your friends' pages, their pictures, the stuff they're saying. And then the thought occurs to you like, man, they, I don't think they do that for me. And then you, you, know, you, you click a little bit and you go to your page and who's following you, who you're friends with. They don't follow me. They've unfollowed you. At some point in your relationship, you had no idea. Oh, I see how it is. 
And that's the first response that, that we get. And then sometimes it's easy to get offended when people don't text you back. Those of you that have problems with that, you're really quiet right now. <laughs> some, of you, some of you use the excuse like, well, I just leave the notification there so that I can know to go back and check it. And you are a thousand notifications short right now. How's that really working for you? Here's how bad it is. Some of us have not texted people back since 2020. You can't go back now. You can, you know, the pandemic, and then I thought, and I was going to, but then I wasn't sure if this was your same number. Like, we, we have no excuse now to text them back. Like, we're just going to have to hope that they don't like us anymore because we can never go back. And then when we throw in, like, we just came out of holidays, and, and the gatherings of families can bring offense really quickly. I don't know if you're a part of a family that everybody contributes to a meal. Hey, what are we going to bring? What are you going to make? All right, I got the macaroni. You bring the mashed potatoes. And, and sometimes there's always, I say sometimes and always together because you know how that works. There may just be in your family someone who never brings anything but their appetite and Tupperware. <laughs> don't point. Don't look at them. And if you're sitting there like, what's wrong? They said everything was good. I I'm just telling you, there might be a little bit of tension with some of your other family members that you never bring or contribute anything. But the to-go box, that's it. Like, what'd you bring today? My stretchy pants. That's what I brought. <laughs> oh, okay. I spent $100 on the food. You don't get any of it. Um, or when we get in those situations with our families, some of us have a few family members that they don't hold back with criticism. From what you got on, to the food that you brought, to the way your kids act, to what you're doing with your life. And it's very quick, like it cuts so quick that you almost don't realize that you're responding from the offense. And these are like, do you notice how the circle's kind of shrinking in from like friends to family? And then when it becomes like people that we love, that deceive us or lie to us, we discover that we've been manipulated or they're saying not just hurtful things, but terribly hurtful things. We've been abused by them. We've been let down by them, manipulated. They begin to take you for granted. They betray your relationship. I mean, you can see how easy it is now to be offended. See what they did to me? Look at what they did. Look at what they did to me. And we begin to relive it and rehearse those same things. And then we begin to retell it to people around us so that we can get people on our side. Look, I, I, I should feel like this, right? Like you see what they, they did to me. We become the victim. We paint other people as the villain. And it feels right because someone did something to us. And it's so hard to not end up here because it feels like it's okay. But it's so costly for our heart if this is where we land because we don't see it happening. Other people may pick up on it, or, or maybe these things will begin to trigger some thoughts like, have you lost the patience that you had a couple of weeks ago or last year? Are, are you shorter with people than you've ever been? How are you resting? Having trouble sleeping? Do you find yourself complaining way more than you compliment? How's your attitude? Do you see people, or do you just immediately go to the problems with the people that you see? See, this is not who we want to be. If you're single right now, like, you know that people aren't looking for someone full of bitterness and resentment. And if you're married, you know that this is not the person that they signed up to be with. 
Well, we made our vows. We were someone different. We don't want to end up here. We don't want to be this person, feel like this. We don't want this stuff in our hearts. So this morning, let's talk a little bit more about getting rid of bitterness. Let's pray together. Lord, we, we ask as we spend time in your presence and in your word that you would speak to us. God, I'm just going to ask for you to do some surgery this morning. Pull back the, the layers that, that we've had hiding bitterness, hiding the fence. Lord, bring it out into the open. Confront us with it so that you can deal with it, so that we can heal from it. God, I pray that as, as we do this, that you would anoint me to communicate your word to your people. Help me to do it in a way that is clear, and in a way that they hear your voice more than they hear mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, growing up, uh, my dad seemed to love to be in the yard. Like, he loved working on our grass. If, if you hear me talk about my dad, like, that's one of the things that I feel like he was way better at than me. And I remember one time he spent probably two years, like, working on our yard. And he was trying to get the right grass in, get the weeds out. And, and man, he was, he was spraying. He'd get the, the right one at first, you know, like, it only kills the weeds. It doesn't kill the grass. And so, like, he'd spray it. And then when he would notice it was dying, like, he'd pull it up by the roots. And then if that didn't work, he'd start spraying the grass killer. He's trying to kill everything in patches. And we're replanting. Like, he worked hard for a couple of years. And the grass just wouldn't do what it should, right? So then one day I was coming home on the bus. And here's the kind of guy my dad was. My dad would take vacation to do projects around the house. I don't understand that. If I take a vacation, it's not to paint my house. It's, it's not to remodel the basement. It's not to do any of that. Like I would like to not do anything. Like That's the goal. That's not how my dad operated. He took vacation to work on the yard. I came home, and as the bus drove down the street, I just looked. It's like, the heck is going on? Our front yard was completely dirt. <laughs> I was not a fan of the things that my father was doing because other people on the bus noticed, who lives in that house? I didn't say nothing. I waited for the bus to go over the hill. Only my friends knew that that was my house. I wasn't a fan of that, but man, it stuck, it stuck with me. What he did that year obviously has lasted you see, he stopped treating the things that he could see, and he decided in order to get the weeds out and the good grass in, that he would have to go for the root. And that's where we need to start. Hebrews 12 tells us to watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up. Well, what happens when it grows up? Oh, it grows up to trouble you. Oh, I can handle that. No, no, and corrupting many. Bitterness is a dangerous root. The seed doesn't just start as bitterness. It starts as an offense, and then it goes underneath the surface. It begins to grow. We can't see it, and it will go deeper and continue to grow. It will destroy love and trust in relationships. It damages things all while we can't see it. And here's, here's something you can check. If you're like, well, I wonder if I'm beginning to, to maybe have some of that. Here's a way to check. So 1 Corinthians 13, you know, when you get married, lots of times we use this as like, this is the love chapter. And it's not for marriage, it's the way that we're supposed to love everybody, right? So 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that love keeps no record of wrong. Bitterness keeps a database. So if you know the date, the time, the words, if you are beginning to collect the wrongs that have been done to you, I would tell you to watch out because I think there might be some offense and bitterness growing inside of us. And the longer we allow it to live in our hearts, the deeper it grows its roots into who we are and the harder it is to kill. But it's important that we get to it because bitter roots produce poisonous fruits. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians 4. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Bitterness is where it starts. And look at the progression. Rage, anger issues, harsh words. 
What we, what we don't see in these translations is when we get into the rage, the anger, like this is all uncontrollable stuff. When we get to the harsh words, this isn't just mean things being said. This is mean things being said a lot and loudly. Some of us can't control the volume when we start losing our temper. That's a sign that bitterness has crept in and is growing roots in our lives. And then it moves into slander. We begin to talk bad about people behind their backs to damage their reputation. And we say things like, well, I'm, I'm just telling my truth. I'm just telling it like it. I'm just saying, like, I'm not lying. But none of this is helping. It's actually hurting me more than it's hurting them. And man, it is so hard to stop once the fruit of bitterness begins to show up. So I want you to see this progression. And I want you to hear the weight of what Paul tells us. The, the direction we are heading ends with people describing our behavior as evil. Other translations, evil behavior is, is said to be malice. That's where we're headed if we don't get to the root. And man, it hides. It hides easy. It hides because we feel justified in how we feel. And then our culture tells us, like, hold on to that offense. Like, you have a right to feel the way you do, and you do. You, you totally do. We do. I do. But Paul tells us that everything may be permissible, but it may not be beneficial. And just because I have the right to hold on to that offense doesn't mean that I should. And just because I have the right to do it doesn't make it righteous either. Here's how well bitterness will hide in our hearts. Some of us came into this room today, we sang, we celebrated the love of God, and we have hatred in our heart for people. And, and, and here's where this is, this is difficult because Scripture tells us that if that other person is a believer, that you can't love God and hate your brother at the same time. This is tough. But it's why we got to get rid of it. It's why we have to reveal it so that God can heal it. So, Lord, I ask you once again, as painful as this may be, God, would you show us the seeds of offense that are planted in our heart and the roots of bitterness that have already started to grow. We ask you to help us to get it out. <sighs> Being offended is inevitable. Living offended is a choice. And it is a tough choice. Our society would tell us the only way that you can live unoffendable is for everyone else to treat you correctly all the time. Well, that's not how it works. I don't know about you, but I've never been treated correctly all the time. So what else do we do? Thankfully, I don't have to figure this out on my own. I don't have to, to work really hard at being better because when I invited Jesus into my heart, he changed things. He actually changes everything and he gives us his spirit. He gives us the power to actually live differently. I showed you one verse in Ephesians 4. Here's the very next verse. Paul's telling us this is how we can live. Instead of all of the bitterness and stuff, be kind to each other. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. And Paul doesn't let up. He gives us more of the same in, in Colossians. Since God chose you to be holy people, he loves. You must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy. That's compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults <clears throat> and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. Paul would tell us in a couple different ways that it's time to get the new on. It's not just enough to put off a fence and, and to dig out bitterness. We have to replace it with something. We have to take off the old and put on the new. Let's get on a little bit more love. 
Th- think about this. When you go shopping and you get new clothes, some of us are wired like my son Jordan, that when you get new clothes, the old clothes are gone immediately. <laughs> Case in point, last night, my boy goes to Cargo Largo in shorts. He came back in sweats. And as soon as he came in the door, he was like, look at my new pants. <laughs> I put them on in the car. I, look, he's the, he, it's so cool getting stuff for him that he likes because this is what he does. Like, you get him a new T-shirt that he's wanted, he will take his T-shirt off right then and put the new one on. He'll leave the tag on and forget all about it for days just because he put it on new. But what he does is what we need to be doing. We need to start taking off this old, this bitterness, these offenses, the stuff that we really don't want, and we got to replace it with other things, and it starts with love. We, we need to work on being kind. That was the first thing that Paul tells us in Ephesians. If I'm struggling with bitterness, I need to work on being kind. Kindness is a key to killing the root of bitterness in my heart. Why is that? Because kindness is love in practical action. If I can begin to, that's a good clap. If I can begin <laughs> to be kind, then I can begin to, to see people and, and have compassion for them. I, I can begin to put myself in their situation. How, how many of you have this like, man, you've lost something like a key to your car or your checkbook if you're older like me. Like you might have lost something and when you lose it, You don't want to find people to help you that are going to tell you how dumb you are that you lost it. We want to find people that are going to be like, man, that stinks. Let me help you look. If I begin to think about it like that, like when I lose it, man, I've already told myself that I'm dumb and I lost it. I want someone that's going to encourage me to find it. I need to try to be kind. So when other people are doing things, I, I want to give them the kindness that I would hope that I would receive as well. I want to be, I want to start small. I'm going to work on being polite and considerate and thinking of other people. And I know that this is hard. That's why it's a part of the fruit of the Spirit. So what does that mean? That means that I don't have to work at being better. I just need to lean into God a little more. I need to ask him for this to show up in my life a little bit more than it's doing. God, I know that you want me to be kind. I need all of the fruit of the Spirit to show up consistently. Can you help me with this? I need to go to him. I need to stop trying to do it all on my own. I'm failing at that. And I don't want to have bitterness be in my heart and who I am. So God, can you help me? Let's get help. It's okay to ask the Holy Spirit to do what he's here to do. We can choose to live differently. We we can respond differently. And Paul starts like needling. And this is the stuff where like, man, I love scripture and I'm frustrated by it at the same time. Because Paul's like, hey, look, um, love like God. Because when you begin to think about it, sometimes our love is conditional And God loves us faults and all. And he doesn't just love you because you chose to come to church today. He loved you before you had an inkling of following him. He loved you in your mess, in your sin, in all before. His love didn't start when you chose him. It's been there. He loved us first. He loved us when we offended him with our lives and with our sin. So with his help... We can try to love people like that as well. We can begin to actually do what he says in Luke 6, where we bless those who curse us and pray for those that hurt us. And this is hard. Praying for someone who has hurt us. Some of us have already given up. Like the minute I said pray for those who hurt you, like, nope. (laughs) Let me help you here. And, and I, I'm not just saying, like, help you, let, let me help you help us help me. Like, this is something that we all deal with. It doesn't have to be this elaborate prayer of blessing that you're praying out over them. Father, would you? No, just start. Some of us can't even say their name. And maybe that's where we begin. God, you know how hard this is, but today I pray for Kevin. 
And that's all you could get. And the more often I do that, the, the more that may change. Maybe three months from now, I pray, God, I, I pray for Kevin and God, would you show up in his world? And then six months from now, maybe you're, you're praying for the one who hurt you and, and you're praying a little bit differently. You're praying, God, I pray for Kevin that, God, you would bless him and, and God, that you would, you would show up in his life and, and change who he is. Suddenly my prayers have begun to change because here, here's the thing. Well, I'm not going to pray for them. They're not going to change. Well, guess what? Prayer may not change them, but it will change And then as I'm, as I'm able to, to bless those who are hurting me and praying for those who, who are like, as I'm doing that, compassion is growing and I find myself responding more like Jesus. It's so crazy. And then, like, as we begin to expose the root and go for it, and as we start putting on the new, then we can get way ahead. Paul helps us to do this. I, I went on a mission trip once. And we were in Mexico, and, and I was a teenager, and, and we like to play pranks on people. So one night, um, there was a gentleman um, that went with us. His I don't I couldn't tell you his name. We only called him Kooky Dude. Like that's when you're 16, like you just make up nicknames. So that was his name. I couldn't tell you. I, that wasn't his name. That's what we called him. And he slept, his, his blankets weren't long enough to cover his feet, and he slept in his socks. And so one night, we thought it'd be really funny to pour water on his socks while he was sleeping. <clears throat> yeah. So we did that. We did some other stuff, and, and the, th this was the first night. Um, so the next morning, one of the, the adults that was there on the trip, he just made a public service announcement. He said, I'm not sure who's playing games in the middle of the night, making noises, doing whatever. He said, I just want you to know this. I don't get even. I get way ahead. <laughs> and that's where this portion came from. Like, I began to think about that because, honestly, we didn't mess with him. We didn't do anything. If he ever woke up in the middle of the night and was like, what are you doing? We went to sleep. Like, we were done. We, no one wanted him to get way ahead. But this is where we can land. We can get way ahead because forgiveness is the way that we can get way ahead. We can get way past the bitterness that's inside of us because forgiveness is powerful. In Ephesians, Paul leaves forgiveness to the very end. He starts with kindness and compassionate. And I think that he did this so that we wouldn't try to loophole him on this. Because some of us live in the technicalities. Uh, I don't want you to, to go to this place. Okay, mom, I'm not going to. And then we catch you at the place. I told you you couldn't go there. Well, you see, technically I didn't go there. Um, I went with someone and I stayed in the parking lot. They actually went inside. So technically I was, oh, see, we tried a loophole. So Paul's like, hey, um, be kind. Let compassion grow. Well, I tried that. They just dismiss me. They don't even care that I was kind. They were just mean right back to me. Like I'm trying to, do, it's not working. I could treat them wrong then, right? Because I tried once. Paul would say, oh, man, I know that that's tough. You, you try kindness and, and compassion towards them? <sighs> All right, just forgive them then. Oh. No, no, Paul, I, 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 can, I can treat them the way they're treated. No, 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 treat them differently. Just, just forgive them. And then the, the Greek is, is great in this because the Greek tells us that we're to forgive them not with a stank attitude. And I wrote that in my notes because that's how some of us act. And, and if you're unsure, I, I do not know what a stank attitude is, Pastor. Here's what a stank attitude is. <clears throat> if you are a parent or have been a child that has received a spanking, before going somewhere, when you showed up to the place or your child showed up to the place, someone's like, what's wrong with you? That's what a stank attitude is. You know, you know, some of you have school pictures with a stank attitude on because you got made to wear something you didn't want to wear. You had a stank attitude taking the picture. Paul says we're supposed to forgive them with a gracious attitude. 
Not one where you're like, I don't want to forgive you. My pastor said I got to forgive you. I'm going to forgive you today. Not like that. A gracious one. Forgiveness like how God forgave us through Jesus. And this is where it's tough because we are supposed to be more ready to forgive than we are to take offense. One is easier than the other. But I'm not trying to make what's happened to you light. I'm not trying to dismiss it like it's not painful today. So limp towards forgiveness if you have to. It, it's, it's okay. It, it's okay that this is what, what Paul is saying. This is the standard that we're supposed to get to. But man, that's Jesus. And I'm not there yet. I, I just want to encourage you to begin to limp towards that direction. Just lean Lean into the Holy Spirit. Lean on God and tell him right where you are. God, I want to forgive, but man, this hurts so bad. I'm not sure if, if I could do this. I know that it may be painful. Maybe not even may. But I want you to be free. I want the pain to heal. I, I want you to be whole. I want to encourage you to forgive. Forgive like we were forgiven. Walk away from the bitterness that has been eating you up from the inside. And here's the thing about forgiveness. This isn't your work. You, you're not working to build up to forgiveness. You are just passing along what's been given to you. Your forgiveness, my forgiveness is not the standard. God's forgiveness is the standard. It's the measure that we use. Well, I'm not sure how to do that. Well, maybe look at it like this. If God was as reluctant to forgive you as you are to forgive other people, how much trouble would you be in right now? And luckily, that's not how he forgives. He forgives instantly completely and generously. He's not holding what we did over our heads, so let's not hold it over someone else's. He offers forgiveness whether we accept it or not. That's the example we are supposed to follow. Well, they didn't ask to be forgiven. So what? Forgive them anyways. Because not forgiving them, allowing that bitter root to grow is killing you, not them. It's changing you, not them. It's growing. Don't forget where all of this leads. That's not who you want. So maybe it starts with you just saying it. Today, as you're leaving, all right, God, I forgive Kevin. Maybe that's all you get out. And maybe the way you say it, it doesn't really feel like it's true or real. That's all right. Do it again tomorrow. God, I forgive Kevin. And then the next day, the next week, I'm just saying it. I'm saying it. I've never wanted to say it before. I've never heard or thought that I could say it. But as I begin to say it, as I begin to respond with kindness and compassion, the more I say it, I find later on that it's actually happened. I said it so much. I prayed for them so much that it began to change me. The bitter root began to shrivel up and die. It's out of my heart. I realize it's happened. But forgiveness, not only is it not easy, but it's not free. See, God's forgiveness cost Jesus his life. Our forgiveness will cost us our pride. It will cost us our right. But it could also cost you the hurt and pain you've been carrying around. It may also cost you the chains that you've been dragging behind you. It may cost you that, but you may discover that the freedom that forgiveness brings wasn't for them, it was for you. 
Some of you have been shackled and imprisoned by offense and bitterness. And as you release forgiveness, you will see that it's you that's being freed. And I don't know, maybe you need more reasons to attack bitterness, to get rid of it in your life. Maybe it's because it will give you a better marriage. Maybe it's so that you can have a a good relationship with your kids, that you can be a better friend, that people will actually want to be around you. But if you need a more spiritual one, I got you. Be like Jesus. Don't just say you follow him and not reflect his character. Don't just like Jesus, be like Jesus. And we can. We can choose today to be like him, to to ask him to help us to get rid of the things that have been growing inside of us, the things that are holding us back. So would you close your eyes for a moment? Maybe today what's been holding you back is What's been dragging you down is the weight of sin. Well, Jesus is here to take that today. If you'll give it to him, he'll take it off your hands. He'll take it out of your heart, out of your life. See, he already came and paid the debt for sin in full. So that means today we can ask him to forgive us, to change us, to free us to give us the power to live like him. And if that's you today, you say, PK, I I need Jesus. I need to be free from sin. I, I need the forgiveness that he's offering. I just want you to raise your hand and look up at me. Who's that for today? Yeah, I see that. Who else? Who else? Man, I need, I need that. Yeah. Patrina. Everybody stand with me real quick. And as we get to this part of the service, this is all about us responding to what God is doing. What's he been saying? Where's he been applying pressure? What has he revealed? And so first, if, if you raise your hand and you say, man, I, I need to accept Jesus. I, I, I need the weight of sin is, is crushing. I need him to take that from me this morning. If you raised your hand or you should have, I want you just to come and meet me at the altar. There was a handful of people. Yeah, there's somebody already responding. Who else? Who else? Who else? We'll wait, we'll wait a minute longer. Who else? Say, PK, man, I, I need, I need Jesus. Thank you, Robin. Now for the rest of us. What has God been saying? Maybe you need to spend some time asking God to heal your heart this morning. That, that you see the bitterness. He showed it to you. He showed you the situation. He showed you the face of the person. And he's asking you to give it to him. Maybe you need to come and give him that. Maybe he's been talking to you about unforgiveness. Maybe you just need to ask him to be more kind. Whatever it is, let's get rid of bitterness this morning. So as the worship team sings, I'll... I would challenge you to find a place to pray, to find a place where you can talk to God about what's going on in your world. Let's let's get this bitterness out. Let's get the root of offense out of there. Let's not carry this around any longer. Respond to what God has been saying. Find some time this morning. Let him in. Let him do some work.